Denise Williams' arrest coming 18 years after her husband vanished. I got him to stand up and I pushed him into the water. I ended up shooting him. Back in 2000, life was ordinary for our family. My son, Mike Williams, was a loving husband and father, and we lived in a close-knit community in Florida. Little did we know that a seemingly routine duck hunting trip on a sunny December day would set in motion a chain of events that would keep us searching for answers for nearly two decades. Let me tell you a chilling story that happened right here in Florida, USA, a long 23 years ago. It was a really dark day when my son, Mike Williams, just disappeared while he was out duck hunting by Lake Seminole. The investigators thought he might have had a terrible accident, maybe falling off his boat and getting attacked by alligators. The official report said it was a tragic hunting accident, that he drowned. But my family couldn't accept that. We started looking into the strange things about his so-called accident. Those weird pieces of the puzzle started to make it seem like something sinister was going on. The investigators began to think that maybe Mike didn't just have an accident, but something really bad happened to him. But they didn't have any solid proof to say who did it. Time went on, it felt like forever, those 23 years, and then finally, there was a little bit of hope in the middle of all the darkness surrounding Mike's disappearance. I'm Cheryl Williams, Mike's mom, and I'm here to tell you about the scary things that happened to my dear child. I'd like to tell you a bit about my son, Mike Williams. His full name was Jerry Michael Williams, but he liked to go by Mike. Mike was born on October 16, 1969, as part of our simple family in Bradfordville, Florida. His dad worked really hard as a bus driver, and I, his mom, took care of the kids. We lived in a small camper van because we wanted to save money and make sure our two boys, Mike and his older brother Nick Williams, could get a good education. Our family might have been small, but we were very close and got along well. Me and my husband always wanted our sons to get the best education possible. We were lucky when Mike and Nick got the chance to go to a fancy Christian school in Florida. We all worked hard, and even the boys helped out by working at a local supermarket to help with our family's money. At school, Mike was really outstanding. He did great in both his classes and in other activities at school. He even became the boss of the student council. Mike wasn't just good at school stuff, he was also great at sports, especially soccer. When he turned 15, he found a new passion, duck hunting. That's also when he met a girl named Denise Merrill, who would become an important part of his life. After finishing high school, Mike went to Florida State University for college. He studied political science and urban planning there. Mike was so smart that he got a job as a property appraiser at Ketchum Appraisal Group even before he officially graduated. Clay Ketchum, the boss of the company, always said nice things about Mike, like how hard he worked and how good he was at his job. When I think back, I remember Mike's love story with Denise Merrill. It felt like something you'd read in a romance book. In 1994, my son Mike Williams married Denise, and from that moment on, their life seemed like a dream come true. They had good jobs, a really pretty wife, and the full support of their family. After they got married, Mike and Denise decided to buy a simple house in one of Florida's fanciest neighborhoods. In 1999, they had a baby girl named Ansley Williams, and Mike turned into an amazing dad. He'd rush home for dinner and then go back to work after his wife and daughter were asleep. From my perspective, Mike was making an impressive $200,000 a year. About a year after Ansley was born, something really sad happened in our family. On that gloomy day, we lost Mike's father, who was a loving dad and a great husband. This terrible loss shook him deeply and made him realize how important it was to make sure his family would be okay if anything happened to him. Life can be unpredictable, and he didn't want Denise and Ansley to be left without any money. 
So, he talked to Denise, and they decided to get a life insurance policy worth $11 million. To help with this, Mike asked his longtime friend Brian Winchester, who worked in the insurance business, for assistance. Brian wasn't just Mike's friend, he was also a close friend of Denise's, and they'd known each other since they were kids. Brian was married to Kathy Thomas, another friend from their high school days. Six months after Mike got the life insurance, on a fateful Saturday, December 16, 2000, which was also their sixth wedding anniversary, Mike did something that changed everything. In the early hours of the morning, before the sun came up, he went on a duck hunting trip to Lake Seminole. Lake Seminole is a big lake about 80 kilometers from Mike's house, and it looked like a far-off promise on that day. Mike told Denise that he'd be back in the afternoon because he was going hunting. He said, we'll celebrate our anniversary later, and gave her a smile. But as the day went by and the sun went down, Mike didn't come back. Denise got really worried, and she didn't waste any time. She told the authorities that her husband was missing, and she called Brian Winchester and their other family members for help. That evening, a big search operation started around Lake Seminole. They called in the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, or FFWCC, to help look for Mike. His case was now officially a missing hunter investigation. During the search, they found Mike's Ford car and his boat, about 69 meters away from where he parked. When they checked the boat, they saw that Mike's rifle was still locked safely in its case, but there was no sign of Mike anywhere. The investigators thought maybe Mike hit a hidden stump underwater while driving his boat, and that caused him to fall into the water and drown, which was about 2.4 to 3.7 meters deep. The people who lived in the area believed that wearing chest waders like the ones Mike had on could be really dangerous if you didn't take them off once you got to your hunting spot. These waders could fill up with water and pull you down, leading to drowning if you weren't careful. But shortly after they started looking, a big storm came, and they had to stop the search because of the bad weather. Mother Nature was really powerful, and it made them stop looking for Mike for a while. After that first search, nobody thought something bad happened to Mike. But as Mike's mom, I couldn't get rid of the feeling that we were looking in the wrong place. I remember those days when I went to help with the search by the lake, along with other volunteers. In those moments, I had this strange feeling in my gut, like a little voice telling me that Mike wasn't at Lake Seminole and that he didn't drown. It was just a hunch, but I knew it wasn't enough to convince the police and the FFWCC to change their search plans. The investigators were really sure that Mike had drowned, and they tried to comfort our family. They said that sometimes, when someone drowns, their body might come up to the surface in three to seven days, or even longer because of the recent storm. We held on to that hope, counting the days, but even after a whole week went by, we still didn't see any sign of Mike. One of the leaders of the search team also thought the same as the investigators. They believed that Mike had a tragic accident and drowned. They said that if he fell from his boat, he'd be the only one out of 80 people who had drowned in that lake, and their bodies were found. It was really scary to think that Mike was the only one with no trace left behind. I couldn't help but think about wild animals in the area where they found Mike's car and boat. I wondered if after Mike fell and disappeared into the water, his body might have gotten stuck in the thick underwater plants called hydrilla. These plants were like hiding spots for alligators, and we knew there were a lot of those in Lake Seminole. It was a really sad thought that maybe one of those fierce reptile predators got to Mike. Ten days into the search, they found a cap that had a hunting pattern in the lake. But we couldn't say for sure if it was Mike's cap because there wasn't enough proof. Even though they kept looking, they officially stopped the search in early February. They said they might start looking again if Denise, Mike's wife, showed more determination to find him. However, since February started, Denise didn't seem like she was trying hard to find Mike. She stayed away from the media during the search. Actually, Denise had come to believe that her husband had died. She even arranged a funeral for Mike, set for the day after they stopped searching. Reports said that Denise Merrill started handling Mike's $1.7 million life insurance money. But even though Mike was missing, the insurance company didn't give the money to his family because the court hadn't officially declared him dead. 
Then, something strange happened six months after they said Mike was missing. A local person who liked to fish found some things floating in the lake, and they thought these things might belong to Mike, the guy we believed had an accident while hunting. The things they found were really eerie, a pair of chest waders, a flashlight, and a hunting jacket. What got to me was the hunting license they found in one of the jackets, with Mike's name and his signature. Strangely, there were no marks from alligator bites or any signs of wear and tear on the chest waders and the jacket. These things didn't look like they'd been underwater during the time Mike was gone. The flashlight, surprisingly, still worked, and what was even more puzzling was that there was no DNA evidence on these things. But just a week later, with this new evidence, a local judge agreed with Denise's request to legally declare Mike as deceased. They said it was because an alligator or some other water creature had eaten him up completely. With this change in her husband's legal status, Denise didn't waste any time and got the full $1.7 million from Mike's life insurance. Five years later, something really surprising happened. Denise got married to Brian Winchester, who was a close friend of her late husband. What's even more surprising is that Brian had divorced his own wife not long after Mike was declared missing. After they got married, Denise and Brian moved into the same house where Denise and Mike used to live together. But the strangest part was that after they got married, they didn't talk about Mike's death at all. Denise went even further and said she'd cut me off from my granddaughter, Ansley Williams, if I kept looking for answers. Even though I decided to stop searching for my son Mike at first, Denise slowly pushed me away from my precious granddaughter. As the days went by, I couldn't shake the feeling that no matter what I did, I wouldn't be able to see my granddaughter. But despite everything, I knew I had to keep investigating. From the very beginning, I never accepted the idea that my son Mike had drowned, let alone been eaten by alligators. Over the next few years, I spent all the money I had in my search for the truth. I put ads in local newspapers, put up signs on billboards asking for help, and stood on busy street corners with signs I made myself, all begging for information. For nine long years, I wrote letters to the governor of Florida every single day, even though some people thought I should give up and accept that Mike was gone. But I didn't give up, especially after talking to experts who said that alligators hardly eat during the cold weather, and Mike disappeared during Florida's winter season. That gave me hope. In 2004, after a lot of effort from me, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement finally agreed to reopen the case. Many officers I talked to admitted that there were strange things about Mike's supposed drowning. These odd things made them question the idea that alligators got him. Now, let's talk about some of the weird stuff that both the FDLE and I noticed. The first strange thing was when they found Mike's boat. The engine was completely quiet, but the fuel tank was still full. If Mike had really fallen and drowned, the boat's engine should have kept running and going in circles until it ran out of fuel. But that didn't happen. The boat just sat there, the engine not working, and the fuel tank full. It was a puzzling detail that made us start looking for answers. Another strange thing made me doubt that Mike had drowned and become food for alligators. My doubt got even stronger when we talked to an expert in reptiles and amphibians named Matt Arasco. He explained that, in reality, alligators usually don't eat during the winter months. On the day Mike disappeared, the lake's water temperature had dropped to 14 degrees Celsius and then even further to a super cold 8 degrees Celsius the lake had even frozen up to 6.1 meters from the shore. In such freezing conditions, Matt said it was very unlikely that alligators would be hunting for food. Instead, they would focus on staying warm. At 8 degrees Celsius, it was just too cold for alligators to be interested in food. Plus, considering Mike's size at 1.78 meters tall and 77 kilograms, it didn't make sense that an alligator would eat his whole body. Matt pointed out that alligators usually don't eat everything, they often leave some parts behind. The third mystery came up when they found various things almost six months after Mike disappeared. These discoveries really made us question the alligator theory. Suspicion grew among the investigators and our family as they looked at Mike's chest waders. There was no sign of damage or alligator bites on them, and they didn't have the residue you'd expect to find on things that had been underwater for such a long time. 
Even more confusing was the hunting jacket and flashlight. They were in really good condition, with the flashlight still working. Finding these things in such good shape only made us believe more that someone had put them in the lake on purpose. It added another layer of mystery to this confusing puzzle. Another confusing thing made me even more determined to find the truth. One of Mike's closest friends, who had gone hunting with him many times, came forward with an important insight. He stressed how Mike always put safety first. When they went on the water, Mike would only put on his chest waders when they reached the exact spot where they planned to start hunting. Hearing this, I became even more sure that Mike didn't meet his end in Lake Seminole. His disappearance was a big mystery that needed answers. But our investigation was really hard because we didn't have much evidence to help us find the person responsible for what happened to Mike. We were suspicious of Denise and Brian. Denise getting Mike's insurance money quickly and her fast marriage to Brian raised questions. It's important to mention that Brian had helped Mike with his life insurance, and their difficult relationship with the police in Mike's missing person case worried us. Even though we had a lot of concerns, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement eventually closed Mike's case again. They didn't believe the alligator theory anymore. But it was really frustrating because we didn't have clear leads or definite proof, and we were stuck in this maddening state of not knowing, wanting the truth but not getting it. As time went on, and the Florida Department of Law Enforcement investigators stopped answering my calls, I felt really disappointed. It seemed like they gave up on finding my son, Mike. Doubt started to creep into my mind, and I started wondering if the people who were supposed to solve cases like this were really capable. Then, in 2008, there was a little bit of hope when the Depositors Insurance Fund from the Florida Department of Financial Services started looking into it from an insurance point of view. In Florida, after five years of investigation, a missing person's case could be legally declared a death, and they could extend it for three more years in special cases. But Denise, Mike's wife, didn't waste any time and wanted to legally declare Mike's death. The insurance company also had its own suspicions that someone close to Mike might have something to do with his disappearance. But, like always, they couldn't find any solid proof. In 2012, Denise and Brian Winchester's marriage started falling apart. There were rumors that Brian was cheating, and this led Denise to file for divorce in 2015. During the divorce, they had to figure out what to do with their shared stuff, which is something the court made them do to make sure things were divided fairly. Finally, on that important day, August 5, 2016, Denise told the Leon County Sheriff's Office a crucial detail. She shared the date when they were going to look at their property, and this marked a big moment in my son's ongoing disappearance. Now, here's what happened, when Denise was on the phone with her sister inside her car, I started to worry. Suddenly, a man forcefully got into the back seat. It was Brian. My heart was pounding as Denise got scared and screamed, hoping her sister on the phone would hear that Brian had suddenly appeared in her car. Brian seemed just as scared by Denise's screams. He quickly took her phone and threw it out of the car window. At the same time, he pointed a gun at Denise and told her to stay calm and not scream. Brian did all this because Denise wasn't talking to him or answering his calls or messages. You see, they had already separated after their divorce, and Denise was staying away from Brian. This separation made Brian do something really drastic, like showing his gun, because he couldn't stand the idea of them being divorced. He felt like he had nothing to live for if their marriage ended. Denise was really scared and trapped, so she had to think quickly and try to calm Brian down to keep him from hurting her. Later, she convinced Brian to stay calm, and they went back to where he had parked his truck. But on the way, Brian suddenly stopped, broke down, and started crying a lot. He even knelt down and begged Denise for forgiveness for what he did earlier. Brian begged Denise not to tell the police about this. Denise promised she wouldn't report it to the authorities. After that, Brian got back in his car and drove away. Denise didn't waste any time, she hurried to the police station to report what had happened, which was really scary. When the police got the report, they arrested Brian right away. They charged him with kidnapping, hurting someone in the family, and stealing with a weapon. 
Denise was really worried about her safety and her daughter Ansley Williams, so she asked the court for a restraining order. One of Brian's friends, who the police later talked to, said that Brian had told him that he was scared about the divorce. Brian was worried that Denise might tell the police about something that happened 10, 12, or 15 years ago. When I heard about Brian getting arrested and all the trouble between him and my former son-in-law, I couldn't help but hope that these events might finally help us figure out what happened to Mike. It had been a really long and hard journey, but maybe we were getting closer to finding the truth we had been looking for, I thought. But I couldn't stop worrying that Brian might not let Denise get away with all that money. She was holding on to hope, praying that Brian wouldn't hide the truth and that he would tell the real story to everyone. About a month before Brian was going to be sentenced, he started to worry that Denise might turn things around on him and say he was the one who planned Mike's murder. Brian felt really hurt and betrayed by Denise. So, he thought about confessing to the terrible murder they did in 2000. He, along with his lawyer, talked to the police and made a deal. Brian said he would tell them where Mike was buried if they promised not to charge him with a crime. The police and the legal team who were dealing with Mike's disappearance agreed to Brian's terms, even though they didn't really want to. This confession was the starting point for unraveling the mystery of Michael Williams' disappearance. Brian and Denise had kept this secret hidden for almost 18 years. Even though we don't know all the details of what Brian told the police, it led to finding Mike's body. Brian admitted that he and Denise had carefully planned the terrible murder, a wicked plan they came up with nine months before Mike disappeared. Brian said it was Denise who first thought of it because she wanted to be a widow and get Mike's life insurance money. I got him to stand up and I pushed him into the water. He got his jacket off and his waders off. He was in a panic, obviously. I was in a panic. I was driving the boat. I didn't know what to do. And I ended up shooting him. As soon as the authorities got this information from Brian, they began searching where he told them to look. They got help from local government officials and tracking dogs, and they started the search all over again. It took them five days and 16 long hours of hard work, but they finally found Mike Williams' remains. They were buried under a pile of dirt and wood. They were able to find 98% of his bones and some of the clothes he had on, like his winter gloves and boots. Through DNA testing, we got confirmation that the body was really my brother Mike Williams. It was a cold day in October 2017 when Mark Perez, a dedicated agent from FDLE who was handling the case, stood in front of reporters during a press conference. He told everyone the sad truth that Mike had been found, and he had been the victim of a terrible murder. They said they found Mike's body at the end of Garner Road, which was only about 8 kilometers from our childhood home in Leon County. Then, in December 2017, Brian was finally sentenced to 20 years in prison for being involved in Denise's kidnapping, and he had to spend 15 years on probation. Brian was the main witness in the trial for Mike's murder. A few months after we found out that Mike's remains had been discovered, something big happened on May 8, 2018. Denise Merrill got arrested in Florida, right as she was leaving her office to celebrate her daughter's 19th birthday. Denise was facing some really serious charges, like first-degree murder, planning to commit first-degree murder, and keeping a dark secret plan to end her marriage with Mike. All because she wanted to get the money from Mike's nearly $2 million life insurance policy. From where I was, it was a really tense moment. Denise's lawyer, Ethan Way, didn't want to talk, he said he didn't have enough time to look at the case. But Brian's lawyer said that Brian would testify if the law said he had to. At the same time, two FDLE officers came to my house. The news they brought was like a big relief for me. I felt much better after hearing it. Later on, the court decided that Denise should be kept in jail without bail until the official trial for Mike Williams' death started. That trial began on September 24, 2018. Denise's lawyer, Ethan Way, said that she was innocent and didn't do any of the things they accused her of. He argued that Brian was trying to make Denise look guilty to cover up his own actions. He also said that the whole plan was Brian's idea. 
The case took a big twist when the prosecutor showed a video of Brian's interview with the FDLE. In the video, Brian did admit to shooting Mike, but he said that it was Denise's idea to kill him. Brian talked a lot about how he and Denise had never really stopped being together since they were teenagers. Surprisingly, they had been dating since high school, even when they were married to other people. Brian said their affair with Denise started in 97, and as they secretly got back together, they started thinking about killing Mike so they could get married. Before the whole Seminole Lake murder happened, Denise actually had a few ideas for getting rid of Mike. One time, she suggested making it look like a boating accident in the Gulf of Mexico, where they could put Mike and Kathy Thomas, who is Brian's wife, in the water. But at that time, when this first idea came up, Brian said no because he didn't want to hurt the mother of his children. After they said no to the first plan, they quickly came up with another one. They thought about killing Mike at his office and making it look like a robbery. But Brian didn't think that plan would work. Eventually, Brian came up with the idea of a hunting accident where he would pretend to save Mike from a trap while they were hunting at Seminole Lake. Well, that last plan is the one they used to actually kill Mike. Here's how it went down on that day, Mike disappeared, and Brian convinced him to go duck hunting at Seminole Lake. Denise knew about it and told Mike he could go as long as he came back home to celebrate their anniversary later that evening. So, Brian and Mike went out on the boat. While they were on the water, Brian asked Mike to put on his waders, and Mike did as he was told. Once Mike was all suited up, Brian pushed him off the boat, and Mike fell into the water, sinking because of the heavy waders. Brian thought Mike wouldn't come back up, but things didn't go as planned. Mike managed to resurface and swim to a tree branch, where he fought to stay alive. Brian got scared and pulled out a gun, shooting Mike and ending his life. Since they couldn't pass off Mike's death as a hunting accident, Brian carried Mike's body into the woods and buried him at Garner Root. Then, he cleaned his car and went back home to celebrate Christmas with his family. Kathy Thomas, who is Brian's wife, was called as a witness during the trial. Kathy told the jury that she had suspected their affair since the late 90s. The prosecutors even played a recorded phone conversation where Kathy, working with the police, told Denise that she knew the truth about what had happened to Mike. But every time Kathy brought it up, Denise tried to change the subject. After four days of the trial, the jury took eight hours to find Denise guilty of all charges. Meanwhile, Brian, the one who actually killed Mike, somehow avoided getting punished for his role in the murder, leaving people wondering why he wasn't held accountable for this crime. Brian received his freedom as a trade-off for revealing where Mike's body was hidden. In return, he got legal protection, which meant he couldn't be questioned in court about the murder. In February 2019, Denise was given a life sentence. She didn't say anything or try to defend herself. As Mike's mother, Cheryl Williams, it was a moment of relief. It meant that justice had finally been done for our family and for Mike. This decision by the court brought an end to the long mystery surrounding Mike Williams' fate. After waiting for 18 years, I finally saw justice for my son. All of Mike's properties and assets, including four houses worth a total of $1.4 million, now belong to my daughter, Ansley Williams. However, this money couldn't be used for her mother's case. If Ansley broke this rule, she'd have to pay a $150,000 fine to the state. Cheryl and Nick Williams, Mike's brother, agreed on this because we wanted our daughter's happiness above all else. It was all done for her well-being. In the end, the long and painful journey to uncover the truth about my son, Mike Williams, had finally come to a close. It was a journey filled with heartache, frustration, and endless questions, but it was also one filled with determination, love, and unwavering faith. Mike's disappearance had left a void in our lives that could never be filled, but the closure we found through the legal proceedings was a small comfort. We had answers, and we had justice. Denise, once the love of Mike's life, was now serving a life sentence for her role in his murder. Brian, the man who had pulled the trigger, had gained his freedom but would forever carry the weight of his actions. And our family, well, we were left with the bittersweet knowledge that Mike could finally rest in peace. 
The properties and assets that once belonged to Mike now provided a sense of security for our daughter, Ansley. It was a reminder that even in the darkest of times, there could be a glimmer of hope and a new beginning. As a family, we had endured unimaginable pain, but we had also shown resilience and unity. Our love for Mike had never wavered, and our determination to seek justice had prevailed. Though we could never turn back time and bring Mike back, we could honor his memory by cherishing the moments we had with Ansley, his beloved daughter. We would make sure she knew her father's love and the strength of a family that had weathered the storm together. In the end, we found closure, and with it, a sense of peace. Mike's spirit would always live on in our hearts, a reminder that even in the face of darkness, love and justice could prevail.